Hey guys, Archer for the Lord here. I wanted to go over the second part uh, of my tactics uh, series that I promised, the double attack. <clears throat> uh, the one thing you should know about a double attack, uh, it's a little bit different from, you know, what we saw in the pin. With the pin, we had a concentration of a superior force against a paralyzed piece. So eventually you keep piling up on it before long, the other side's defenses will run out. With a double attack, we don't use brute force, but instead, um, you know, because of the way the pieces move, every piece has the possibility of attacking things in two different directions. You know, the rook, while it's attacking this pawn, it's also attacking this knight. Um, you know, the pawns can attack in two directions. Every piece can move and attack in at least two different squares, so every piece can do a double attack. <coughs> One of the most common double attacks that we see, and one of the most difficult for beginner players to see, is a knight fork. Now, because the knight has a strange movement, you know, it moves in an L shape, uh, either one space over and two spaces up, or one space up and two spaces over. Uh, because of that, um, we see sometimes knight forks are easy to miss, even for players of, with, with lots of experience. So, in this position, black has just captured the pawn on b4, and if it weren't for white's tactic, he'd actually have a pretty good position here, you know. The material's equal, and he's the one that has the outside past pawn, so he has the better chance of winning. However, uh, it turns out that white has a tactic here, and it starts by lots of exchanges on b4. So rook c takes b4, rook 6 takes b4, rook takes b4, rook takes b4. Now, I'm sure most of you by now have seen it, the way that we can win material here is knight to c6. Now if we go back and look at the very beginning of the position, Knight to c6 wouldn't have worked right away. Um, you know, then the knight could just capture it back and no dice. But we see if we're able to look a couple moves ahead and examine things like maybe if we examine every check and every capture that we have in the position, we would see that after this fourth sequence, knight c6, the king must move, and we can now take the rook and win the game. So, again, with the double attack, what we're looking for uh, is basically two pieces being attacked at one time. So, okay, here's another position. Whoops, sorry. Oh, <laughs> gotta fix that. <laughs> um, basically, here we see this naughty black knight has captured one of Black's white pawns, and it's not really defended. So if we could attack it while attacking something else, we'd have a double attack. We'd win one of the pieces. So here, Black's knight intends to just give itself up for this bishop. You know, if things get really bad, he can always play knight takes bishop. But with white to move, he ends that with bishop takes a6. There follows rook takes a6, <clears throat> and now we see a double attack from a different piece. Last time we saw it from the knight, and this time we see it from white's most powerful piece, queen to d3. And notice this trade has left this piece unguarded, and this piece was already unguarded. When you see loose pieces in a position, you always have to be on the lookout for tactics. Uh, loose pieces uh, are what leads to, to tactics like these if they're undefended. So, I mean, even though black can throw in a check here <coughs> after king g2, it's all over and one of the pieces is going to be lost and with it, you know, the game. Um, so, there's a lot of times when you can do um, attacks with pieces. 
I'm going to show you one where you can also do a similar attack with a pawn. And in this position, <coughs> in this position, uh, this is actually Alexander Grishuk playing Alexei Dreyev. And I'm sure you already saw it, but c3 was the move here that Grishuk chose. And if you notice, it's quite easy to see that the threat is to go to c7 and fork this knight and this rook. Um, Black has a couple of different choices here, but they all lose. Uh, first of all, we'll examine if he captures this pawn. Knight d takes c6. Then we see a double attack from the knight again. Knight c5. And after the king moves, the knight will capture this bishop, and white will be ahead. Another thing that could be done, instead of getting forked here, let's say white tries to move one of the pieces that's in the fork, rook c8. And this is what Drea played in the game. This move still does not work, because white can continue with c7, or also he can play knight d c6 in this position as well. But c7 was played and black was on. And the reason is, you see this bishop here, and while it's not unguarded, it's not very well guarded. And when you see a piece that's not stable, you know, it's being attacked and it has a defender, if we start to look at pieces, um, and I can't remember, I know someone on YouTube said this before, but if we start to think of this piece that's being, if it's defended once and if it's attacked once, we have to start viewing it as unguarded. So basically, because it's already being attacked once, if anything were to attack it again, it's, uh, it's on pre, it's, um, it's being threatened to be, to be captured. So in this game, we see Treyev resigned, and uh, a wonderful, um, a wonderful move by Krishna. Uh, now you may think double attacks can only happen at the beginning of the game, uh, and I'm, as I'm sure you may know already, they can happen even at the beginning. So this one's kind of famous: e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, knight c3. This is in the four knights variation. Uh, a lot of times we see black do bishop c5. Uh, you know, while it's not crushing, uh, white does have a tactic here involving a double attack. White can play knight takes e5, and after knight takes e5, d4 regains the piece. Now you don't want any material here, but you may notice that after a move like bishop takes d4, queen takes d4, it's white that has a central pawn, white has two pieces developed, black has one piece developed that's being attacked, and there's also a pin along this a1 h8 diagonal, because this pawn is now uh, unguarded. Um, so in a variation like this, many times players will play this without thinking, okay, what happens if knight takes e5? and you can use this to your advantage. <clears throat> Another opening trick that we see, this was actually, let's change the board around, oops. This was actually, um, supposedly according to Wikipedia, this is the shortest professional chess game on record. Uh, that was decisive because not not because of you know someone like didn't show up for the game or something or you know forfeited. Uh, d4 was played. Knight f6. Bishop g5. And after c6, if White plays b3, then we always have to be mindful of pieces on the fifth rank because. The white queen 
can attack the king and pick up something on the fifth rank. So anytime, you know, if we're white and you have a piece in the fifth rank, or if you're black and you have a piece in the fourth rank, you have to be wary about this diagonal because the queen can attack your king and also attack anything on this diagonal. Uh, I'm going to show you one more example <clears throat> before we end today. Um, now, sometimes, you know, we've talked about attacking. Uh, let's this again. We've talked about attacking different, um, two, you know, two different pieces. Double attack can also be against a weak square. In this example, uh, we noticed that white has an extra pawn, but black has a very active rook, and he also has two bishops that are bearing down on the enemy king. So with black to move, he has a very strong move uh, that wins a piece. Rook e3. And why does this win a piece? Uh, can't white just move his bishop away or protect it? Well, one other thing we notice is if the bishop moves, that gives up this e2 square. The rook can then come to e2, and it could be attacking this pawn. So white doesn't really want to move his bishop. Um, the other thing we notice is that if white just tries to protect it, so with rook d1, Black's previous move, you know, rook e3 was a double threat. The other threat was on this h3 pawn. You may have noticed too that it's being pinned by the b7 bishop. So white must lose a piece because if he tries to protect with rook d1, then follows rook takes h3 mate. The king cannot move anywhere and it cannot capture this rook. So uh, we see that the double attack is a very powerful tool, but uh, you know, unless your opponent's a beginner, you're not really going to be able to get this off unless you're able to calculate ahead. Uh, yeah, I probably should mention this in my other videos, but calculation is really the thing that you want to learn here. Calculation is what sets uh, beginners apart from stronger players. The further ahead you're able to calculate before you make a move, the better you'll do. You'll know what the resulting position looks like, and your opponent may not. So, what you want to try to do, what I recommend, uh, you know, do do chess puzzles. Uh, there's tons of websites you can go to. I know plenty of people have put chess puzzles on YouTube. But try to work on your calculating ability. Try to see, you know, a couple of moves ahead. You know, this whole sequence. You know, if we go back, you know, this is a pretty short sequence here. Rook e3, you know, with that kind of a threat. But if you can just calculate a few moves ahead, um, you know, it really can be can help you out with your tactics better. And I think you'll find that you'll develop a lot quicker in chess. Um, you know, if you just try to work on your calculation, you know, rather than trying to memorize, you know, tons of openings, uh, work on your calculation, and that'll help your tactics to improve, and you will win more games. Alright, uh, thanks for watching as always, and you guys have a great day.